Well, throughout our analyses, we have found that mask wearing reduces the risk of transmission by about 50%, and that still holds true. And so at the individual level, you have a reduced risk of both transmitting and, and being infected by about 50%. It's probably uh, varies by the quality of the mask that you wear. At the population level, for the first time in our models, we're finding that the population effect of enhanced mask wearing is quite small. It's about a 10% reduction in cumulative infections from Omicron from now forward. I mean, it's still there, but in the grand scheme of things, it's relatively small. And the reason for the, those two being true statements, the 50% reduction for wearing a mask, is that the risk of transmission with so many people with Omicron in the community is so great that even a 50% reduction doesn't really do much to the population level. Think about it that if in a given day, if you're going to be exposed to Omicron six times, well, you may be exposed only three times, but you're still going to get infected. And that's sort of how this logic plays out in the modeling. And it's really about the speed and intensity of Omicron. And certainly uh, we still strongly believe that masks, the act of wearing a mask reduces the risk of, of transmission on a one-to-one -one basis. The new uh, lineage, the BA2 lineage that is now emerging as the dominant strain in Denmark, um, has coincided with sort of a secondary uh, increase in transmission in Denmark. And there's really three explanations for that. First is that people that have had Omicron from the BA1 lineage can somehow get infected again with BA2. It's possible, but probably unlikely. The second possibility is that the mutations in the BA2 lineage may mean that more people are susceptible to it than BA1. So in other words, the immune escape that we know is there, about 50% for BA1 from past infection with other variants uh, may be you know, even greater so that suddenly there's a new pool of susceptibles and the same could be true for protection against through vaccination. Uh, it's interesting that uh, in Denmark already, according to the Serum Institute reports that are reported there, the uh, rate of Omicron in the vaccinated is actually somewhat higher than the not vaccinated, um, it's not probably statistically significant. In other words, they're about the same. Um, and so there may be something to do with the sort of also uh, who is out uh, getting ex exposed, who is going to higher risk settings. The third explanation is nothing to do with immune escape. It is something to do with just the, the behavior of what's going on in Denmark. Uh, we're seeing a, a, a secondary ripple in Northern Ireland, in England, in, in a number of districts. In the latter case, it's only in children from the ONS infection survey. In Denmark, it's, we don't know that. It seems to be more broad based, uh, but it could be something else going on in terms of behavior. Remember back in August when Delta ripped through Scotland, came down, it then had a secondary Delta wave, thought to be related to school openings, but never really proven. Um, so there could be some behavioral aspect in Denmark that we don't understand. The, the good news from Denmark on BA2 is there's no indication that it's more severe. So it might have an even bigger surge of Omicron than we, we thought, even more than half the population getting it. Uh, but probably isn't cause for alarm in the sense that it doesn't look to have enhanced severity. The reason COVID in a number of countries, but not all, goes up very quickly and then down very quickly uh, is because it's very infectious. It has immune escape, so there's a lot of people who can get it. And once you run out of people who are susceptible, then the, there isn't anybody left to infect. And so incidence comes crashing down. And we've seen this happen in a number of places, you know, South Africa, the first place, but we've seen it in a number of countries, you know, look at Malta or Cyprus as examples of that. Now, when we see a slower decline in some countries, uh, often those are larger places so that you're essentially at, at the national aggregate level, seeing the big surge, for example, <clears throat> in the United States in Connecticut, followed by its spreading to other states. And so when you add those all up, you get a slower decline in the tail. So we're seeing a bit of a mixed pattern. Uh, 
But in general, we are expecting because of transmissibility and the idea that we're basically running out of people to infect with Omicron, that it should come crashing down uh, on, on the latter side. Well, it's a very uh, interesting question. I think uh, given the high prevalence in the community of Omicron during the surge phase, testing asymptomatic people will just yield more and more people that test positive, that have no symptoms, and will lead to more people having to stay away from school, more contacts of those children staying away from school. Given the very low risk of Omicron in terms of severe outcomes, uh, it seems unwise to test asymptomatics. And then for symptomatic individuals, of course, sick children should stay home uh, and you know, return to school at the point where uh, they're, they're no longer symptomatic. Uh, I think our, we have to change our general expectation that we are not in a, in a situation where we can stop at the population level this wave of transmission. And so then we have to be focused on, on you know, reducing harm, protecting individuals from either severe disease going to hospital or certainly of, of, of actually dying. So a focus on harm reduction leads you to make different choices than a focus on trying to control transmission. The way to understand our future risk, because we do expect new variants to come, and some of those variants could be more severe than Omicron. That's certainly a very real possibility. But we don't expect, even if that occurs, for, thing, for future waves in terms of hospitalization and death to be as severe as the Delta wave in the past. Uh, and certainly Delta was worse at the global level than, than the previous Alpha and, and ancestral variants. Why? Well, basically, the group in the world who is at greatest risk of a bad outcome are the unvaccinated and never infected. They are what we call immunologically naive. They've never seen the virus. Their immune system has never seen the virus or any part of the virus in the sense that the vaccine, you know, based on the spike protein, those like the mRNA vaccines are exposing your immune system to a part of the virus. So the group, the naive group that have never seen any part of the virus are the ones at greatest risk of bad outcomes. Now in the future, we, we according to our modeling, there's less than 5% of the world at the end of the Omicron wave that is in this immunologically naive category, it may be as low as 2%. So we won't have the same group of very at risk individuals in that future wave when it comes. And so we don't expect the outcomes to be the same. We expect them to be much better. Add on to that, that we have a new, tool in the, the COVID management strategy, which is these highly effective antivirals like Paxlovid from Pfizer. And if, as, as long as those antivirals can be scaled up and made available widely and, and prioritized while, while there may be a scarcity of antivirals for the most at risk, those over 65, those with comorbidities, we should be able to, even in a, in a future wave, see greatly improved outcomes from what we have today. And I think it's that combination, um, more population level immunity and the availability of antivirals that will mean that governments are going to be unlikely to put in place mandates uh, around behavior uh, going forward. Where we have um, the uh, genomic sequencing data, the, the GISAID database is what we largely use, supplemented by some national databases. Um, Omicron in about a 14 day period completely replaces or almost completely replaces Delta, very rapid uh, 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 replacement of Delta. So we don't think that much Delta will be around because Omicron is so much more infectious, has more immune escape. Uh, and on top of that, the neutralizing antibody studies that have been conducted so far are giving us the indication that Omicron infection is providing quite good protection against Delta or should. So the combination of those, that even if there's some Delta virus in pockets circulating, we don't think it'll come back as in a Delta wave. And so that seems quite unlikely. The 80 to 90% asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic comes from uh, initially looking at data in South Africa, where we had reported cases, you had hospitalizations and deaths, and then you had these representative samples that were PCR tested, uh, women showing up in antenatal clinics, 
uh, people being enrolled in prevention trials that suggested that 30, 40% of people on a given day were PCR positive. And if you calculate the numbers back and, and none of whom had symptoms because they, they didn't report symptoms, you calculate that back, you get a huge fraction that are asymptomatic, even more than the 90%. When you look at other uh, data sources where, for example, uh, on routine screening for kids coming back to school in, in a number of school districts in the US, you're finding five, 6% of children, no symptoms uh, that are testing positive. Uh, another type of data that's telling us about this large uh, fraction of asymptomatics is um, pre-hospital, pre-admission screening for people coming in for, for uh, scheduled procedures. So these are people without any symptoms for, for COVID and testing positive, for example, in our own hospital here in Seattle at 10%. Uh, so lots of uh, indications of this huge volume of infection in the community. And then um, most of, many of them not having symptoms or very, very mild symptoms they wouldn't even identify uh, unless uh, somebody sort of asked them to recall. Uh, other types of studies that support this idea include, um, you know, the screening of, of professional athletes, where they're picking up these large numbers of asymptomatic or extremely mildly symptomatic uh, um, infections. So uh, putting all those pieces together, we have to recognize that the previous numbers for Delta, which were about 40% asymptomatic, it appears that the numbers are much higher for Omicron in the category of asymptomatic or, or very mildly symptomatic.